Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad you're here. We're live from SPNN in St. Paul, Minnesota, just three blocks away from where approximately 260 uh, babies were ripped apart from their mother's womb and killed. Uh, a couple of interesting things that has come out uh, in Canada, 766 babies were left to die after they were born. In other words, they were meant to have an abortion, but they were born live, healthy babies. Abortion didn't happen in time, whatever. Live babies. 766 were left on the table to die. They, they were born, they were put on the table, and they just cried themselves to death. Uh, that's Canada. That's our wonderful neighbors uh, to the north that have such outstanding values. Of course, United States, you know, we're, we're doing that. People have been caught doing that, but it's against the law. In Canada, it's not against the law. Uh, this is uh, depravity of depravities. I mean, the, the disrespect for human life. Uh, it only gets worse from there. You know, it, it, it doesn't get better when you devalue a baby born and healthy and you leave it on the table to die. The, the, you, you only get worse. It, it takes a miracle. I mean, and, and look at countries, all these countries, where when you accept this type of behavior, it, you know, that behavior is okay for older and older and older people, you know. And then what ends it, stops it, is good people with the war, uh, unfortunately. And right now, good people, well, they're not doing things. There are good people out there trying to do things, but there's a lot of people who say they're good who are sitting on the sideline and not doing good because they're sitting on the sideline and not engaging in this atrocity. Uh, that is the Democrat Party today, the, the, the party that is okay with this. Now, they'll say, oh, that's, well, you know, they've been fighting the sanctity of life, the value of life for a long, long time. And you had all those Nazi sympathizers, sympathizers with uh, I just forgot her name, but she was the, the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger. And she was a Nazi sympathizer. But that was the Democrat Party then. It's the Democrat Party now, and it's huge. And the minority communities, abortions, because Sanger didn't want the minority community. She wanted as many of the minority community to be exterminated as possible, to the point once abortion became questionable and illegal, then they were looking at eugenics and the forced sterilization and then all other ways. And then the marketing changed to Planned Parenthood. But that's your Democrat Party today, which is it's a little weird while the, and I'm going to have a guest on fairly soon here uh, making the arrangements right now, why the Somalis, why the Muslims are supporting the Democrat Party when Muslims are pro-life. Uh, they're not pro-democracy. Uh, well, they are if they're in majority, and they think they will be uh, at one time. Uh, so being a democracy will be beneficial to them because then you'll have mob rule. But yeah, I, I suppose they're not a, for a constitutional republic, especially not for our constitution. Um, but We'll, we'll talk about that. Why are the Somali community going to the Democrat Party and not the Republican Party? And there are some people that are rather upset that that's taking place in the Somali community. Uh, the Somalians are upset about it. So we'll see what happens. And, and of course, that, that brings me to Keith Ellison uh, running for attorney general. There's no question in my mind that the only reason that he's running for attorney general is because 
he has to cover up the Somali daycare fraud or the Muslim daycare fraud and cover up the welfare fraud that's going on. And, you know, all the evidence is out there. It's why haven't these people been convicted of committing this fraud, even though the Attorney General's office, Lori Swanson, knows it's going on right now. Why, why is she doing nothing? She needs to do something. Why isn't the Attorney General's office, of course, I see this more as uh, the Attorney General Mike Freeman from Hennepin County, uh, you know, he's filing charges against, uh, boy, something that was in the news the other day. I don't know if somebody died or, or I, I don't remember the situation. So he's filing charges there, but it was public information. So here you have public information on Keith Ellison, but Mike Freeman's not going and getting a subpoena and saying, hey, we need to see that video because a crime's been committed, an assault's been committed. That's what's been claimed. So why isn't my, uh, Mike Freeman doing that? Why isn't Lori Swanson doing that? They need to do that to clear up the false allegations against Keith Ellison if they are false. If they aren't false, well, there's, a, there's another crime. If they, if they are, are false, there's another crime. Uh, you know, uh, falsely reporting, you know, claiming an abuse. You know, so right now, that whole abuse allegation looks very political and Keith is denying it um, uh, because it says it can't exist because it never happened. And you know what, that's, that's a legitimate thing to say. Uh, but it's easily rebuttable. And uh, all they have to do is get the video. And guess what? Lori Swanson or Keith Ellison can go get it uh, with a warrant, and, and they're not doing that. Um, so that's why I think Keith Ellison gave up his safe seat and the Attorney General. Uh, also, he had a really good idea that Ilan Omar will run, uh, would win that seat. And of course, the Somali community is coming out in full force and, and voting where other communities are not coming out and voting. So it's whoever shows up in the majority wins. And so Ilyan Omar won that, no problem. Uh, so, and it's very likely she'll win the general. So that's how Keith could give that up, that seat up, Keith Ellison could give that up and then go run for attorney general and then cover up the because remember, cover up the daycare fraud, because remember, the Minnesota's Attorney General's Office and Hennepin County's Attorney General's Office, they did not prosecute on this. It was it turned into a federal case. It had to take the federal Attorney General to prosecute that case and get a con one conviction out of it. Okay, where, you know, if you're transferring out $100 million, there's gonna be a lot of con uh, convictions there. So a lot of people were committing fraud. Now individuals may be on a smaller level, but on a bigger level there's people organizing it. So that gets us into that area of voter fraud. So there's just a whole lot of this fraud going on in our minority communities and pretty soon we'll have a guest that will explain how it takes place in the minority communities. Uh, out there and is a witness to it. And uh, so we'll see what happens there. But our show today is gonna be about judges and the judiciary and people running for office. And it will, so how many shows talk about the judges? You know, I mean, if they get a minute on the news that's, that's going to be interesting, <laughs> you know, and maybe they'll cover the Supreme Court race, maybe they'll cover the appellate court race, but the local district court races will not be covered. This show is going to do it, and it's going to do it quite extensively. And I'm going to give my recommendations, and, and why, and so in order to do that, I'm going to 
this is about me, my beliefs. You may totally disagree with what I believe, how I believe. Matter of fact, you can even call in 651-361-8161, give me your opinion on these things because I've talked to some people today and they, they give, gave me their opinion as to why they'd vote for somebody or not vote for somebody. Uh, so one person says, I'm not voting for a prosecutor. Okay, I'm, I'm voting, or not uh, for public defenders. Well, that's, that's their issue. I wouldn't have a problem voting for a public defender. And I'll actually explain something that's going on in the public defender's office. So let's get into this. Here's, here's my philosophy. And I start with the very aspect that, oh, and Dallas, could you hand me a timer, kind of get it close? And I forgot to set that up here. I guess I could look at my clock here. Um, start with my philosophy here. And basically we're looking at the judiciary right now is unaccountable. Nobody, very few people are attempting to hold the judiciary accountable and nobody in the legislature is, and nobody uh, in the judiciary is, uh, except for the Board on Judicial Standards and the Lawyers Professional Responsibility Board, but they're more after protecting the system than they are about holding judges accountable when they violate people's rights or, or uh, commit fraud themselves. So, so that's my one big philosophy, there's no accountability. Well, how do you get accountability in, in the judiciary? Well, you have to have people that will be willing to stand up against the judiciary. And one way to do that for the people is to vote out judges, okay? There's a reason judges aren't getting voted out. And the main reason is nobody knows about them. And more importantly, very few people challenge a sitting judge. And we talked about those reasons, and the number one reason is the judges have the word incumbent behind their name. Uh, and they don't want to run against that word since nobody knows about the judges. Most people, I haven't heard anything bad about this judge, okay, I'll vote him in. Vote for him again. Uh, or some people are out there just saying, incumbent, I'm just throwing the incumbent out, okay. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, just want change. You know, it's very base, bottom line uh, reasoning. Both of them are just kind of non-thinking reasons. Now, there may be good reasons to do that and totally legitimate, uh, but if it's just, okay, I haven't heard anything bad, uh, so I'm gonna vote them, you know, you got to do more than that. You need to find out what a judge is about, what their philosophy, judicial philosophy is, what they think, how they've been rolling. Uh, do they support the Constitution? Even though they swear an oath to the Constitution, they get to interpret what's constitutional or not. And so my philosophy here is because there is no accountability, and particularly because very few attorneys are willing to run against a judge, my philosophy is always vote against the incumbent. We need to shake the judiciary up to say, I can't rely on that incumbency. The other reason is if we get non-incumbents to run and win, that will encourage more people to win and it will take away the punishment, the number two reason people don't run against a sitting judge is because those law practices will be punished because then you're not part of the good old boy system. You've gone against the governor who appointed them in the first place. And those people may have been pushed by big law firms. And so they may come after you. And judges have come after attorneys that have ran for office. We got it on record, you know, in, in court affidavits. The judges have said they have done that. And attorneys that have said, this is what happened to me in court. So it's, it's, a, it's a political, nasty business, our judiciary. They are, not all of them are decent people, which, which is a kind of interesting thing here when, when you go to 
uh, the websites of people running for judge, most of them, are, most of the websites are kind of a feel-good website. You know, I got family and been involved in these associations and these people are backing me and, you know, it's a kind of uh, backdoor endorsements uh, for political parties. And so you have a lot of this feel good. They're trying to pitch themselves and sell themselves as well they should. Uh, but to me, it seems more of about a feel good thing rather than about how, how they'll rule. Are they gonna be uh, original intent? Are they gonna be uh, strict scrutiny? Are they gonna be conservative? Are they gonna be liberal? Are they gonna be, uh, is the Constitution a living document? Or is it gonna all be a case by case? You know, I'll see how I rule. You know, it's, who are they about? I mean, this is important. These are the people that rule over you. These are the people that can damage your life the most. Are these people, do they have integrity? You know, and, and how do you know that? How do you find that out? Well, I think if more people are in the race, then more people, uh, you're going to be able to find out more. Now, something happened in Ramsey County here that is just unbelievable, is that five seats are contested elections. And I'm looking at these seats, all except one of them, I'm going, there's public defenders here running against these sitting judges or running for these positions. You know, what's, what's going on? And in my research, I'm getting the vibe that the public defender's office was kind of pretty ticked off at how some of these judges were behaving and violating constitutional rights and violating people's rights. So uh, kind of, and I also know that you, also, you need your permission to run against a sitting judge. I mean, it's not something you go out and do on your own and expect life to go well for you. I mean, this is the culture of the judiciary, okay? I'm just telling you what they know and the attorneys know. This is nothing new. So I'm asking people the question, hey, why are you running against a sitting judge? You know, that's dangerous. Yeah, well, they admit it. And they go, well, I mean, that's not just this election. It's other elections. So, you know, we're, you're not going to be pinning anything down on the people I've talked to because I've talked to a lot of them. They're basically saying, we got permission, okay? And uh, in, in particular, the public defender's office is kind of ticked off. So, we're, you know, depending on how these elections turn out for judges in Ramsey County, that uh, public defender's office may start losing a lot more cases, <laughs> you know? I mean, this is personal for a lot of these judges. You know, it's a job. They could lose their job. If you know, so they want to intimidate people not to run, you know, uh, kind of, kind of like that Trump silencing people. They're going to try to silence people too, and they're going to use intimidation, as some judges have done. So, but that's part of the game that's going on. But just underlying some of these races, understand that the public defender's office is. Um, kind of showing itself forth there and try, trying to make a statement, in my opinion. Uh, now, I have a friend I talked to today, never, would never vote for a public defender. Uh, I don't know why, it doesn't make sense to me, because I would. Because uh, public defenders have a, sometimes have a better idea of the Constitution, how to defend it. They also know how what happens when uh, judges don't uphold the Constitution and rights are trampled and, and lives are ruined. So it's, it's a big deal. So uh, the other thing that's going on is uh, if a judge tells you, I can't talk issues about, ask them specific questions. You know, ask them, hey, 
Cameras in the courtroom. If you're a judge, will you allow cameras in the courtroom? I want to see what's going on. I want to know what's going on. I don't want to just rely on the biased press to tell me what happened and what didn't. I want to see. I like this Manifold, <laughs> Manaford <laughs> uh, here trial that happened. So he's got all these uh, tax problems. Well, did the jury get it right? You know, are they accountants? Did it, can they figure it out? I, I want to see the evidence that they had against them, but we don't get to see that. Now we could go out and try to get it. Now with freedom of information, the hearing's done. Maybe we can get this evidence of what he did uh, or didn't do or how it was interpreted by the court. But I would have liked to see it during the trial to have a better understanding of what's going on. But no, the federal courts, no cameras in the courtroom, but the press can be in there, just can't videotape it. Why? The Constitution says freedom of the press. There's no reason they shouldn't be in there. So they make up all these other reasons and nobody's really challenged it uh, yet. And hopefully an attorney will pick up my case because I've been denied filming, so who knows. But when they say you can't talk about the issues, ask, ask them. Ask them about, are you for uh, ICE? Are you for uh, having the federal system uh, of getting illegal immigrants uh, that are here and arresting them? Are you for or against it? They can't tell you, oh, I can't talk about issues because the Supreme Court said you can. You're running for judge. You get to talk about issues. You have freedom of speech rights, too. Now, a judge can say, I'm not going to answer that issue. I don't want to. And then you can decide whether you want to vote for him. But you can give him a little bit of grief. You know, be polite, be kind, be respectful. The judge should be the same, or the person running for judge should be the same way. But just don't be bamboozled by it, okay? They can talk issues. You want to know where they stand, they can tell you if they want to. Um, now, another issue going on is uh, dealing with the Republican Party and as far as endorsements go uh, for office. And the Republican Party under its past leadership with Keith Downey and the person before, uh, I forget who that was, and we had a couple short timers, were really blocking uh, Republican Party endorsement of Supreme Court judges. We had some good quality people running for office. And, and believe me, once you get this attorney's, you know, juris doctoral degree, uh, you know a lot, you don't know everything. It's good to have a judge in there that has some good experience and, and knows things, especially for what area of law you're going to practice in. Uh, but you, you pretty much know the procedures and how they work. So I think any attorney with a good 10, 14 years of experience uh, could be a judge. Uh, but the Republican Party uh, was refusing to endorse candidates, uh, good qualified people. And during that time, they refused to endorse the Supreme Court went from a 5-2 Republican majority, so to speak, if you consider these people Republican, down to a, uh, no, it went to a four, from a 4-3 majority down to a 5-2 minority. And word on the street is that uh, some of the justices' spouses who are considered Republican are really now trying to get Republicans endorsed because we need them in the judiciary. Uh, my understanding, I've been told, is, I haven't checked the numbers, that 80% of uh, the j judges currently have been appointed by Mark Dayton. And so he's a Democrat, he's going to be liberal. You know, my personal belief, Democrats could care less about the Constitution. Uh, so. We'll, we'll, we'll see, you know. So the Republicans have just vacated that. And now they finally, maybe they finally, at least in the court, they've realized the error of their ways and now are going to try to recover. Who knows? 
But that's why this next election for governor will be important because they select the judiciary, unfortunately. Okay, it's too bad we can't open, have open, fair elections uh, without uh, reprisal, but we don't have that. And you don't really get a say. And we're gonna see what some of these judges, people running for judge have to say and why they're running. Uh, now the Democrat party doesn't endorse. Okay, but what they do is they put their individual names underneath a judge's endorsement page. So you have a lot of individuals endorsing, but no groups for these uh, Democrat judges. And uh, so you just recognize the names of who's voting for them. So that's how the Democrats endorse, you know, but they say, oh, you know, but they're against endorsing judges, you know, a well, baloney. You know, the party doesn't do it, but the people do. It's, it's amazing, you know, for the uninformed, the scan. And, and don't forget, there's another party out there, and that's the judicial party. Uh, and you're going to see the judiciary supporting every incumbent judge. Okay. Except maybe at Wall. Uh, I, I can't remember. I'll have to check his website again. Uh, because he had a DUI that's in Ramsey County. But you find a lot of the former Supreme Court justices supporting the judiciary, the incumbent judges, and that's for a reason. That's to protect that incumbency label. And they know it, but they, they play this game pretending they don't know it. All right, so uh, with all that going on, Here's how I select and who I select for, for uh, who I'm going to vote for. So the first seat we're going to talk about is the Minnesota Supreme Court. And uh, let's bring up the picture of Margaret Chudich. Uh, there she is. Uh, she's an incumbent. Uh, she's currently on the uh, Minnesota Supreme Court. She was appointed in 2016 by a Mark Dayton, or you can bring it back to me. So uh, that was Margaret Churich. Uh, what's important to know, she's appointed, she was also appointed to the appellate courts uh, by Mark Dayton, and then had to run for reelection two years later and was reelected. I don't know that she had a challenger in that election, um, but then uh, either way, she won and at the appellate level, and then she was appointed to the Supreme Court. So a lot of judges, and you look in this race, there's a, you know about over 100 judges up for election, and uh, all but eight have challengers. Okay, <laughs> excuse me, only eight have challengers. Okay, <laughs> all right. So what's going on there? Um, so. Uh, some of her career highlights, she's a member of Lavender Bar Association, assistant dean of Humphrey Schools of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I consider her to be liberal in her judicial philosophy. Maybe she's not. That's, that's an opinion. That's my opinion. Uh, she does have a website, www.justicemargaretchudich.org. And um, so you, uh, all these people have websites, so you can go see them. She uh, went to the University of Minnesota, graduated from the University of Michigan Law School. And uh, her wife is Dr. Penny Wheeler, and they have one child. And uh, just one quote from her, equal justice for all is the bedrock principle in our justice system that motivates me every day to bring my best effort to this worthy and challenging work. Okay, so that's Margaret Churdage. And then there's, uh, and, and there's, go to her website, there's a lot more there you can find out and, you know, do Google searches. It, it's just, it's a little difficult to find on some of these lower court judges, but the Supreme Court, uh, appellate courts, you know, the websites are out there. Most of them have a website, so. But it takes some work. But all of you get to vote for the Supreme Court. So the other 
uh, person is Michelle McDonald, uh, running for the Supreme Court. Uh, her current position is the McDonald Law Firm, 1987. Uh, she's also been a judge on Co Conciliation Small Claims Court in Hennepin County from 1999 to 2014. Uh, she was the North Star Lawyers Pro Bono Award for 2013, 14, and 15, and founder of volu and volunteer president of Family Innocence, a nonprofit dedicated to keep families out of court peacefully. Uh, her website is mcdonaldforjustice.com and uh, she had her education from Boston College in Suffolk, I don't even know how to pronounce, Suffolk University Law School. You know, somebody from back east is gonna have to say that. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, so her judicial philosophy is conservative. She has a husband and uh, Tom Shimoda and four children. Her interesting statement is appellate courts are not doing their job in holding our judges and lawmakers accountable. Uh, pretty, pretty strong statement that I found there. But now, who am I voting for based on everything I said prior? Okay, I'm not for the incumbent. Okay, I'm always against the incumbent. It just, just hasn't worked yet. We need to replace, we need to tell the governors we, that, hey, the people want to elect these judges. Okay, and that's how you do it. You vote against them, even though they may be somebody you like. Okay, so the reasons I'm against Margaret Chudich is because she is an incumbent. She was uh, appointed by Mark Dayton. Uh, She's gone unchallenged, and as far as I can remember, she may have had somebody run against her at the appellate court. Uh, but she's also a liberal. Okay, that's kind of my order of things and I don't want a liberal. I, I now, some people are gonna be upset about this, but I, she's married to a woman, okay? So I don't think, my personal opinion, that a person that doesn't understand the laws of nature and natural law should be sitting on our Minnesota Supreme Court. I mean, you don't get that, so she's made an emotional decision there on having a wife instead of a husband uh, or being single, uh, but she's basically doesn't understand the laws of nature. And so how is she gonna understand other aspects of law? So uh, my, my recommendation is Michelle McDonald. She's very experienced. She understands the corruption that goes on in our courts. She's been persecuted by our court judicial system. She's been on my show, uh, and there's so much going on out there. Uh, and she's willing to say, hey, we, this system needs to be held accountable. And, you know, how is it that a judge would put an attorney in handcuffs and make them practice law before them? And you know what, the federal courts and the Minnesota state courts say, oh, judges have immunity. Are you kidding me? We have rules, we have laws, we have regulations, the courts have them, and when you go after a judge for violating those, they just, ah, who cares? You know, so these judges that say, hey, we're going to uphold the law and the Constitution, our current judges, uh, a number of them, could care less about that. And you need to know that, okay? I mean, David Knutson in Dakota County, my goodness. I mean, there's, there's a number of judges in Dakota County. But Michelle McDonald will bring light to that. We do not have a great judiciary, even though people are saying it's a respected around the world. Well, you know what? That's because they don't know the truth, okay? However, our judiciary got a very low rating by a judicial watch, gro a watch group. And the number one reason was they're covering up for the bad behaviors of our judiciary. Anyway, so between, for the Supreme Court, between Margaret Chudich and Michelle McDonald, I'm with Michelle McDonald uh, for the reasons I stated. Now we got another really interesting race coming up in the appellate courts. Uh, and 
the current appellate court, and this is the only contested race in the appellate court, one contested race in the Supreme Court, Lucinda Jessen is the incumbent, okay? She was appointed by uh, Mark Dayton, and prior, in 2016, that's why she's up for election, our Constitution says you gotta, you gotta run for election if you're appointed first. Uh, most times, people don't run against you, okay? <laughs> uh, but somebody is this time. So appointed by Dayton, she has to run for election here. Her past position was Commissioner, Minnesota Department of Human Services, okay? Uh, and she said, a significant part of my career was spent addressing constitutional issues from reproductive rights to civil rights. And she was on the board of directors of Lutheran Social Services. Uh, in my opinion, her judicial philosophy is liberal. Uh, her website is judgelucindajessen.com. She graduated from University of Arkansas and University of Pennsylvania Law School. She has a husband, Peter Knapp, and four children. She says, uh, a judge should understand not just the written law, but the circumstances of the people who come before the court. So a little bit there of uh, a judge shouldn't have blinders on. <laughs> Sounds to me like, okay, so, okay, you know she's an incumbent. Number one criteria for me in this day and age you know, I'm not going to recommend her. Okay. Now, well, let's get to Anthony Brown. Anthony Brown is uh, uh, his current position. He's a public defender. Uh, I believe it's Ramsey County, but I'm not positive. Could be Hennepin. I've, I forgot to check that. Uh, public defender, 2015 to present. Uh, past position, Capital City Law Group. Uh, yeah, where's general practice in civil and civil and criminal. Uh, career highlight, uh, U.S. Supreme Court, he had a case called Wall versus Stanek. This is a case where, and he lost in Minnesota. I, I th he went federal with it, lost in federal. Well, I don't remember if Minnesota had a piece of this or not. Typically, they have a piece before you can go federal. but. Someone was pulled over for drunk driving, and they took a urine and a blood sample. And he went and challenged that. They ended up only being .06. And he said, hey, taking a blood sample is, a, is too evasive. It's uh, without a warrant, violates the fourth protection rights. You have to have probable cause to do these things. They didn't do a breathalyzer, I, I believe. They just went straight to the urine and the blood sample. And then she was, wasn't drunk driving, okay? So he appealed it. It went to the U.S. Supreme Court, but there was another case, I believe a Minnesota case already there that had already been heard. And that case was again about taking blood samples. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, hey, no, you, you have to have a warrant in order to take blood samples. And so uh, even though Wall versus Stanek didn't get to the Supreme Court, it, the, the Supreme Court didn't hear the case. They sent it back to district court based on the current ruling that they just had with this other case. And... Uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's been heard or not, but I mean, he was right. And uh, he, he took that challenge on and was called crazy all the way there, you know. But that's what happens when the courts want their own laws and when people, ha you know, when they don't want to uphold the Constitution. So anyway, he doesn't have a website right now. He's getting uh, one up. Uh, ready. He graduated from Chicago State University and Hamlin University Law School. Uh, his judicial philosophy says is libertarian, uh, more of uh, uh, the when the government's coming after you, you should you should look towards the side of freedom, okay? And, and what helps a person be free 
instead of all these entrapments of laws where no damage is done to anybody, but you're still committed some kind of crime uh, or, or, or accused of some kind of crime, but nothing happened. So he's kind of libertarian more towards the freedom, and I, I may have messed that up a little bit. But he did say, and finally, an appellate judge must have the courage to tell its judicial colleagues on the lower court or its own court, own court when its decisions are unlawful or unjust. <clears throat> wow. Good point, that, <laughs> I, I, it's amazing. I mean, McDonald, appellate courts are not doing their job in holding our judges and lawmakers accountable. Here's Anthony Brown. Uh, an appellate judge must have the courage to tell its judicial colleagues on the lower court or its own courts its decision are unlawful or unjust. And, and I mean, that's kind of, hey, court, you need to spell it out. You need to look at these judges that are violating constitutional rights. And we've seen it on the show where these lower court judges and even the higher court judges, when people are bringing constitutional challenges before the court, the court isn't even listening to them. They just... Throw it in the wastebasket. That's it's outrageous. You know what they do? They go, oh, I, I don't want to deal with this. I just got denied. I'm not even going to give a reason. I don't have time for this. That's our Minnesota courts. And finally, I, I think a lot of uh, people running against these judges, or at least the ones that are running in Ramsey County, and there may be a rebellion going on there. I don't know. Uh, is saying, hey, that's enough. You need to rule on these motions that are dealing with constitutional issues. And you need to find, give the findings of fact and the conclusions of law and, and have the evidence there and, and, and do it because you're harming people in that process. That's a strong statement. So anyway, uh, of course, my voting is for A.L. Brown over Lucinda Jensen not only because Lucinda is an incumbent, not only because she was appointed by Mark Dayton, but also because she was the Commissioner of the Department of Human Services uh, and the department's messed up. And, you know, not only with the um, elder abuse, not only with the Somali daycare, not only with the welfare fraud, the system is unchecked and unaccountable and that was going on, in my opinion, why Lucinda Jessen was there. Now, she's also on the board of directors, or was, of Lutheran Social Services. Now, Lutheran Social Services is part of the refugee crisis that is going on in Minnesota right now. And that refugee crisis is we're bringing people in from countries who, these people travel back to their countries. That's not a refugee. Refugee is you're afraid for your life and you need to come here, and you're seeking refuge here to be safe in the protections of our Constitution. But that's not what happened. When, when we're sending hundreds of millions of dollars back to these terrible places uh, that are supposedly unsafe, and people are traveling back there with millions of dollars in a briefcase, I wouldn't feel safe. But they do it freely, and they feel safe. So why are they here as refugees? That's, you know, that's a question, but Minnesota Luther, or Lutheran Social Services is part of the problem. So to me, Lucinda Jessen is there to cover up what's going on with our uh, refugee crisis, and not only being Department of Human Services, not only being on the Lutheran Social Services Board, but being a judge in all those situations, uh, that just smells to high heaven. Of, of a cover-up here, you know. So I'm, I'm for A.L. Brown. That's why I go for or against Lucinda Jessen for the appellate court. All right. <clears throat> I need to go faster. So uh, I'm going to deal with First Judicial District just because it's a unique situation also that we aren't seeing very much. Uh, Arlene Perkio is the incumbent. Uh, she was appointed by Mark Dayton, and she, uh, so who's a Democrat, she was in private practice before, 
uh, taught classes on immigration consequences for non-citizen clients at William Mitchell Law School. Her website is Arlene Perkio for judge.com. Graduate of William Mitchell Law School, went to McAllister as a husband, Dave, and three children. Uh, so the other person she's run against is Martin Judge, you know, a judge for judge uh, is his website. Uh, is there some, I don't know, it's all, oh, could you get Martin Judge up? Next one. Uh, yeah, Judge, and that might be some predestination going on there. I don't know what Judge for Judge. But uh, St. John's University, William Mitchin College of Law. Uh, the why I bring him up is interesting. Uh, his current position is uh, the Judge Law Firm. Uh, he was endorsed by the first judicial district Republican Party. Uh, so they have endorsed him. So that makes what's make this race interesting. It's the only contested race in uh, the first judicial district, which is Dakota County, Shakopee, uh, those areas, uh, is that he had the endorsement. And why I think his race is important, it's what will a Republican endorsement do in a Republican area? Will it defeat an appointed judge by a Democrat governor? That's why you kind of want to watch that race. But for prior reasons I have said, voting against the incumbent, uh, I am for Martin Judge on that situation. Okay, let's get to Ramsey County, this local area. And we got five races and approximately two minutes each on each. So Deanne Hilgers is the incumbent, appointed by Mark Dayton. Uh, and past position equity partner Lindquist and Venom, uh, named rising star in the legal field four times. Website is judgehilgers.com. Graduation, uh, well, University of Minnesota, William Mitchell Law School. Uh, as a husband and children, uh, so you can look at our website. Uh, has a lot of, in some information on our website, not a whole lot. But her challenger, Tom Handley, current position is Ramsey County Public Defender, Office 1997 to present, uh, and he was uh, in law in uh, Colorado. He, he was given the Falve Award, Ramsey County 2011, uh, an award by the Ramsey County Public Defender's Office for Achievement and Leadership. His website is TomHandleyForJudge.com, Metropolitan State College of Denver, Hamlin University Law School, Judicial Philosophy, uh, don't really have that. Endorsements, not accepting endorsements. He's single but has three children. Handley, uh, he says, be the change. And this is kind of why, another reason why I like him. Judges are appointed by the governor based on recommendations from people who are also appointed and virtually unknown to the public. These judges run unopposed for their entire career. I am running for this seat because I know I can do a better job. All right, so this may be one of the uh, public defenders that are, think the judges are violating people's constitutional rights. Is that Deanne Hilgers? I don't know, okay? But obviously he thinks he can do better than her or he wouldn't be running against her. And so anyway, because he's not the incumbent, because he's running against a sitting judge that has been appointed, uh, I, am, I would recommend Tom Handley and I'll be voting for him. Okay, uh, next race. Uh, this is an open seat held by Judge Bastian. And this is Michael uh, Flaherty. Uh, Flaherty for judge.org. Uh, law school was University of Iowa College of Law. Uh, I, I just got to skip a lot of this, but his husband, he has a husband, Dr. Adam Foss, and one daughter. Uh, and so there was a four way primary. He came out on top. Uh, he's got endorsements of all the liberal people in the area. Uh, and, and so then his challenger is Adam Yang. 
switch that. Uh, Adam Yang for judge.org. Uh, Hamlin University School of Law, he's in private practice. His wife, Teresa, Theo Yang, and three children. Um, my understanding, he's also very liberal. So, um, the, to me, you got just two bad choices for this open seat, you know. Uh, so my tendency, of course, then this comes down to what, what I did with the Supreme Court justice is saying, hey, Michael Flaherty doesn't understand the laws of nature and natural law and went out and has a husband where Adam Yang, at least he understands the laws of nature and natural law and married a woman and has three children. So you may call me homophobic, uh, you can, I'm not. Uh, I think biology matters. I think science matters. I think physics manage, matters. I think emotions need to be put in check. Okay, and you may feel like some way or feel like doing something, but you don't do it, you know, uh, because it goes against biology and science and logic and reason. All right. Okay, Minnesota 2nd Judicial District, seat 14. We have Robin Milnacker. Uh, she was appointed by Tim Plunny, a U of M Law School, and has a husband and four children. Um, she's the incumbent. Uh, she was elected uh, afterwards, after she was appointed. I don't know. She probably ran un unchallenged. Now she's got a challenger, Marcus Allman. Marcus Allman, not Almond. Have you seen that commercial? This is Allman. Okay, almondforjudge.com. Uh, Hamlin Law School, uh, he graduated from 13 years public defender, Ramsey County, uh, and he has a son. And of course, I'm going against the incumbent here. I don't think Polanyi should have appointed, that she had to let these races, people run for these races, and let the people decide. Uh, and Marcus Allman, I, I, I think he's the guy, and especially he understands this family law garbage that's going on and the division. And I'm hearing on Robin Milnacker is that she doesn't understand the importance of two parents in the children's lives and uh, is making some really bad decisions. And so that's why I'm going for Marcus Allman. Okay, Tony Atwal. Oh boy, we're oh yeah, two left, so kind of doing all right with time. Website, judgeatwall.com. He was appointed by Mark Dayton. That's why he's up for election this time. Will Mitchell School of Law. Uh, he's a single person. Uh, he had two DUIs. He already had one DUI against him, and then just this last year had another one. Uh, <clears throat> and, of course, the issue there, he's appointed by Dayton. Uh, and then you have P. Paul Yang. Uh, and I didn't fill out the sheet here, but he's got a, his wife Marley and three children. Uh, he's on the board of uh, Hope Community Academy, I believe was the name of it. He has private practice, uh, and there's some of uh, his legal background up there, which I can't read, but maybe you can. So he's got that. He's got a website, Paul Yang for Judge, uh, Judge Atwell. Uh, dot com is the other judge. Of course, I'm going against the incumbent on that one, and for P. Paul Yang. Okay, and the last one is uh, seat 28 in Ramsey County. Elena, Elena Ospi, as appointed by Tim Plunny, run re-election. Uh, I don't believe that she uh, was opposed by anybody. She may have been the last time around. Uh, personally, I've been in her court. I've seen her courtroom. Uh, I think she doesn't go by the proper procedures. Uh, people don't even get to give their name you know, until later on the case is already heard, you don't get a chance to do your in limine motions, you know, and then wonders why you're doing them later. Well, she wouldn't let you talk. 
you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And I've had other people in front of her and she doesn't understand retirement situations. It's either that or she's a very biased judge. Or, but she's the incumbent, uh, University of Minnesota Law School, she's single. Um, I would not vote for her. Who I'm voting for is Kalanda Revering. Uh, she's uh, Revering for judge. She won Mitchell Law School. Uh, so go to her website. There's also something else going on in, in these elections. Not only are the, in, at least in Ramsey County, the public defender's office uh, is running, is challenging the, a lot of these seats. There's also a diversity coalition, which uh, Kalanda Revering, um, a a a L Anthony Brown, and Marcus Allman are part of, and one other lost in the primary here uh, that was part of that diversity coalition to have a better balance uh, on the judiciary. And of course, if you vote in all these uh, challengers, you're gonna have a lot more diversity on the Ramsey County bench and on the appellate court than we've had uh, in, in, than we've had. So anyway, we're out of time, right? One minute. One minute, all right. Well, that's my opinion. Uh, you guys are gonna have your own and, and go do your research. Find out who you wanna vote for and why. And it's important that you know what's going on in our judiciary. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. Uh, God bless. Have a great week.